lies, intimidation, and the enemy extinguished by the Lord with the truth. Hezekiah pleads for more time and God gives it. But was that for the best? And the Apostle Paul gives the gospel to King Agrippa. Today on 3 in 1, as we consider 2 Kings chapters 19 through 21 and Acts chapter 26. Do you remember David and Goliath? Do you remember how huge and hairy and scary Goliath was in your mind's eye when you first heard of him? Towering over little David, as all the men of Israel were cowering behind David, as Goliath bellowed out, or rather growled out, a challenge every morning, every evening, for what seemed like an endless amount of days. And everyone was intimidated as he spewed out his lies concerning the God of Israel. And everyone was intimidated by his lies. That is, until David came with bread and cheese for his brothers. And he heard what this uncircumcised Philistine was saying. See, David was not intimidated by Goliath's lies because David knew that Goliath was picking a fight with God. I mean, you're picking a fight with God, Goliath? Any one of us could walk out onto that battlefield and whoop you because this battle belongs to God. In fact, I'll go. And you know the end of the story. And once again, we learn that all the enemy has are lies and intimidation. Well, lies and intimidation are extinguished by the truth. You see, we read of David uh, in that account where he said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Booyah! (laughs) <laughs> a little kid can go out there because Goliath defied God. Well, in 2 Kings today, the enemy was not a big, hairy, scary man named Goliath, but rather another man with another scary name, the Rabshaka. Doesn't that sound like a villain of some sort? The Rabshaka. We first heard of him in our last reading, yelling outside of the city walls, yelling lies and intimidation, where he said, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you from his hand, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. See, here was the first volley from the enemy, from the emissaries of the enemy, and this was against their earthly leader, the earthly leader of God's people. The second volley, as we read today, was directed directly against God himself. The Rabshakeh said, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them. And shall you be delivered? Oh, big mistake, Rabshaka. You just picked a fight with God himself. Now this battle belongs to God. And do you remember how God fought this battle? One angel. One. That's all he needed. And in one night, that one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. (laughs) Oops. That wasn't very wise, Rabshakeh, even with your extremely intimidating name and your extremely intimidating threats and lies. Now, how did Hezekiah handle all of the lies and intimidation? Well, he handled it really well. And he's a great example to all of us as we encounter lies and intimidation from the emissaries of our enemy. See, he, he cried out for help from the Lord when that first volley came. And he listened to the Lord. He listened to the truth of the Lord from the prophet of the Lord. And when the emissaries of the enemy upped the ante and directed their attacks against the Lord, Hezekiah spread out their letter before the Lord, acknowledging that the battle belongs to the Lord. And as we saw, the Lord is more than able to fight his own battles. 
Now, before we go, I want you to know what Reb Shaka truly means. It means chief butler. That's it. Sounds scary. Sounds like a scary villain from a movie as he was spewing lies and intimidation. But when you see him for who he really is, he's only a man. He's only a man with a with a funny name, and that's all. It's all smoke and mirrors. So, don't fall for the lies and intimidation, no matter what the emissary of the enemy says. No matter what emissary the enemy sends, you just keep bringing all their garbage to the Lord. And you let him fight the battle for you, encouraging you with the truth. And if the enemy ups the ante and directs their attack directly against the Lord, then good. Maybe he'll dispatch an angel or two. <laughs> okay, now, unfortunately, Hezekiah did not live his entire life sinlessly. Unfortunately, Hezekiah was not a good example for us in every way. Towards the end of his life, he was an example of what not to do. And we read of that in chapter 20 of 2 Kings, as the chapter begins this way. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days 15 years. Now, I get it. No one wants to hear that they're going to die. But this word was from the Lord, the Lord that loved him, the Lord that loved his people. And Hezekiah, he really should have heeded this word and trusted this word from a God who is omniscient, a God who knows everything. But instead, he prayed for his own personal preference. And God gave him what he asked for, 15 more years. Now, how could that be bad? Well, we read today what happened in those 15 more years. Well, one, Manasseh was born. Manasseh was one of Judah's worst and most wicked kings. And then two, because of pride that developed in Hezekiah's heart as he grew older, Hezekiah gave a personal tour to the enemies of Israel, a personal tour of everything. And three, because of that personal tour, Isaiah told Hezekiah that this would ultimately lead to the destruction of Judah and eventually their captivity by the Babylonians. And then One of the worst parts of all of this is how far Hezekiah's heart had sunk during these 15 years. When Isaiah gave him this information of the ripple effects of his sin, Hezekiah said, well, all right, if that's what the Lord wants, good. But what he was really thinking was, at least there will be peace and security during the remainder of my own life. Man, be careful what you ask for. I mean, again, I get it. We're human. We're not omniscient. So when we're hurting or someone else is hurting or even dying, of course we should ask God to heal. But I think there's wisdom in the addendum that Jesus had in his own prayer to avoid suffering. See, even he asked three times, if there's any other way, Lord, let it be another way. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours, Lord, your will be done. And had Hezekiah added that addendum to his prayer, maybe all this would have been different. I mean, Manasseh definitely would not have been born, and maybe the Babylonians would not have invaded to steal, kill, destroy, and take captive God's people. Maybe. But surely Manasseh would not have been born. Manasseh. Man, what a wicked king. From such a great king. It said this of Manasseh. 
and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal and made a wooden image as Ahab king of Israel had done. And he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he made his son pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Manasseh seduced the people of God to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Man. And then there was his son, Amnon, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. So he walked in all the ways that his father had walked and he served the idols that his father had served and worshiped them. He forsook the Lord God of his fathers and did not walk in the way of the Lord. Man, could it get any worse? Now, at the very end, we hear the name of the next king, Josiah. And he is Amnon's son. And Amnon was the son of Manasseh. Will it get worse? Or will this eight-year-old have a heart for God and turn everything around? Well, we'll find out in tomorrow's reading. Now, on to our New Testament reading, Acts chapter 26, where Paul gives the gospel to yet another government official. Now, Paul did not produce these opportunities to preach. They were just handed to him as a result of the opposition that he encountered. Man, how many times the attacks of the enemy backfire? He, he must get so frustrated. So, King Agrippa came for a visit to see Festus. And Festus told him about this man named Paul. And Agrippa wanted to hear from this man named Paul as well. So, Festus arranged it in an auditorium with all sorts of important people. And when Paul was brought in, he must have lit up with excitement, thinking, man, you just can't make this stuff up. I bet they're about to ask me to give my testimony. And they did. Now, they were probably thinking that his testimony would be like a testimony in a court of law. And it was to a certain extent. But it also included his testimony concerning his conversion to Christ, including his life before Christ. In verse 9, we read, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue, and I compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. That was his life before Christ. And his testimony also included, as we read today, his encounter with Christ. We read this in verse 12. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Man, his testimony, right? His testimony included his life before Christ, his conversion to Christ, and his testimony included his life with Christ after coming to Christ, after Christ came to him, after Christ converted his heart and filled his heart with the love of the Lord, love for the Jews and love for the Gentiles. We read this in verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, 
but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Man, what a testimony. Now, a testimony is a powerful thing, usually including the three components that we read in Paul's testimony today. One, our life before Christ. Two, our coming to Christ. Three, our life after Christ. After Christ converted our hearts and filled our hearts with his love and with his life. And anyone listening to a testimony like that cannot avoid being confronted with Christ, forced to consider the claims of Christ, forced to make a decision for or against Christ. And knowing this, Paul seized upon the opportunity when he saw it start to happen. Verse 24, we read, Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I speak also freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Oh man, that is so good. Lord, help us, help us today to have faith like the Apostle Paul that sees and seizes opportunities to testify, even and especially in the midst of opposition.